Hi, this is Eric Boyce, CEO and Chief Investment Officer for BKA Wealth Consulting, and welcome to Charts and Chat for January 22nd of 2023. Please share disclaimer for important information. We'll get started this week with the equity market and looking at the estimates for year-end index values. Um, this is uh, from Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey, Survey of Professional Fund Managers. And so... Uh, before we get started, it's, it's kind of good to know that the S&P 500 closed on Friday at 39.73, and so the um, average of all respondents uh, here in this survey as of January 23rd uh, called for an ending S&P 500 value of 38.92, which represents a slight decrease from where we are today. Now, I, uh, I would caveat here that you know, beginning of the year forecasts are almost always wrong. In fact, uh, the, this consensus at the beginning of last year predicted a S&P 500 at 4,900, and they were uh, quite off uh, from that mark. So, you know, take this with a bit of grain of salt. Uh, it does show, though, something that I think is healthy, and that's a divergence. It's not a, you, know, you don't find people really tightly coalescing around a certain level. You see 3,800 to 4,000 gets the most respondents. Uh, followed by 4,000 to 4,200, and then behind that you get 36 to 38. But you know you, you see that a little bit of dispersion. So I think there's a fair number of people that are anywhere between I'd call it 3,500 and 40. You know 300 would be kind of a, a, a range. And so you know again that uh, it's it's up for speculation at this point. Uh, I think I think fund managers in general are trying to be a little bit conservative because they were quite off last year. And I, I think there's still some some unknowns. Uh, and I think this survey is probably jaded a little bit. And we might talk about this a little bit later about the debt ceiling issue that is kind of emerging here with this uh, kind of hardline faction of the GOP uh, making uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy's life difficult and trying to forge a deal to uh, raise the debt ceiling uh, with the Democrats. So we'll see how that plays out, but that's obviously something that's going to emerge over time. And we do have some slides coming up on that. Now, as we look at the equity market right now uh, and, and look at it from a technical standpoint, it's actually in an interesting position. So this is a 200 day moving average in that red dotted line. Uh, uh, and then uh, overlaid with that is the S&P 500 going back to November of 2021. And so uh, we know what happened last year. Markets uh, were were obviously down, uh, and 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 in a general downtrend. And so, you know, there is a, a technical um, trigger that's uh, that's hit when you have uh, the S and P 500 that breaks through to the upside on a sustainable way uh, on its uh, two, or I guess across its 200-day moving average. And you can see here it's. It's touched it several times, and and you know I, I'm I'm more of a fundamental analyst, but I do respect the technical analysis uh, that is done in the market, and there it, and it is very meaningful. But you can see here where it's touched the 200-day moving average, which is in a downslope because we know the market's been down, and so 200 days, if you think about it in terms of a year, it's you know essentially a little less than two thirds of a year, but. Uh, but we haven't been able to sustain a breakthrough there. And so we were kind of at that point once again uh, to see where it's sustainable. Now, you know, if you can break through it in a sustainable way, you know, say call for uh, 10 to 14 days or something like that, it's generally symptomatic of an uptrend, uh, which certainly would somewhat belie the economic backdrop, which is kind of calling for a recession. Uh, but you know, I do think the the equity markets have the ability to oscillate uh, quite a bit uh, between now and, and, and the summer uh, as we are speculating on all of these things. Here, looking at it a different way, here is the uh, S&P 500 once again, uh, but overlaid with uh, both a 50-day moving average, which is the one that's a little bit more volatile because, again, you're not averaging as many days, and so it's up. It's apt to be a little bit more uh, more curvy, I should say. And then, uh, and then instead of the 200-day moving average, you have in red the 150-day moving average, which is still significant. And so, this this technical indicator is actually pretty bullish. Uh, and so, 
what's happening here is that we just saw within the last week the 50-day moving average pass through to the upside of the 150 day. And so this isn't just the index itself. This is a moving average of the index. And so this is even more powerful, a signal in terms of suggesting that the market has sustainability uh, to the upside uh, here. Uh, and, and typically when you do see this, the markets uh, can uh, hold a, a, a general uptrend for a while. So we'll just have to see. Uh, but technically, I can sum it up by saying this is a positive technical indicator if you're looking for stock market upside. Well, let's offset that with what's going on in the fear barometer. Uh, and again, overlaid by the S&P 500 in the black line, the fear barometer, uh, and this is a Credit Suisse uh, indicator. Um, and it's in the blue, and, and you can see the, the high degree of oscillation here around these averages and the, and the green and the red represent kind of a kind of a range of sorts and then uh, the dotted vertical lines represent you know some points of meaningful dislocation uh, including uh, major uh, including in the midst of major recessions and so obviously we're not in that now as far as we know uh, but needless to say the fear barometer as it relates to uh, investor sentiment is as low as it's been since 2009. So let's talk about um, the 10 year break even rate. So this is the implied inflation rate. And uh, you've heard me talk a lot about how much stock uh, that I and the market puts into what happens in the bond market, right? Uh, investors tend to agree that the bond market does a better job of anticipating and interpreting economic signals than the equity market does. And, and there are a lot of reasons for that, which we won't go into here, but uh, needless to say, the 10-year break-even rate, essentially the 10-year yield minus the 10-year tips yield, uh, is suggesting inflation down the road of closer to 2%. And you can see where that number's actually come down throughout the year uh, it's something that I, I, you know, I certainly noticed a little bit earlier this year, but the fact that that continues to come down uh, is, is pretty, uh, it, it not only impressive, but also suggestive uh, that we're uh, looking for slower uh, overall uh, inflation uh, and uh, uh, perhaps slowing overall economic growth. And here is the 10-year uh, Treasury note. So uh, we see that the yields are moving back a little bit higher on the 10-year. You know, they had dipped down uh, just here within the last uh, couple of days. Uh, you know, kind of touched almost 3, 330, 3.3%. Now they're moving back up, which is interesting because we also see that tips break even yield go down. So what it means here is that even with yields kind of eking higher, uh, you've got your break-even anticipated uh, inflation rates moving lower. And this chart shows us uh, from Deutsche Bank that we've got some serious inflows coming into the bond market. Uh, you can see how that is, you know, ebbed and flowed. And, you know, last fall, uh, we had a lot of outflows. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, especially out of longer duration uh, of funds that with interest rates moving higher, uh, and whatnot, and then we saw maybe the, the the expectations begin to build that we were close to the end on interest rate increases, and that it was likely to stall out long term rates. And so, you know, now we see here with some speculation uh, coming around, uh, you know, in in the equity market that is driving more bond inflows. And uh, you can see from a, a, a weekly data standpoint, going back to May of twenty one, uh, the uh, the inflows last week were really profound. And as the market uh, digests all of the data and everything that's in front of it, uh, you can see here that the implied probability of a 50 basis point Fed rate hike uh, at the Fed Federal Open Market Meeting, or excuse me, Federal Open Market Committee meeting next month, uh, that, that that probability is going down. And so, you know, conversely, what that means is the probability of only a 25 or one quarter of 1% uh, rate increase at that FOMC meeting next month is going up. And so, you know, this this is, you know, really kind of a, a, a symptomatic of 
of the feeling that um, uh, you know rate increases are uh, waning, that we're closer to a pause point for the Fed where they can gauge for perhaps a, a, a couple of uh, meetings or so to see what the impacts of their rate increases are. Uh, now, not everybody at the Fed is on board with that. Uh, in fact, I just read this morning article on uh, uh, Fed uh, Governor Bullard from uh, uh, FRB in St. Louis, Federal Reserve Bank in St. Louis, arguing for continued you know, half point increases. But here, clearly the sentiment is that, that that probability is going down because we're seeing a little bit of erosion in the jobs market, although honestly, it's not that much. But the CPI report uh, clearly is rolling over. We talked about that last week, and that, that's clearly rolling over, even though the aggregate price levels are still pretty high. And here is that market implied terminal rate. This is the rate that the market expects the, the, that short-term interest rates will stall. And, uh, and, and that number has been hovering around this level, as you can see here, since essentially mid-October and uh, kind of jockeyed around a little bit, kind of rolling over now a little bit. And people are feeling like, you know, perhaps they don't have to go uh, more than a couple of times at 25 basis points a piece. Now, you know, I think, you know, the, you know, the, there's a consensus out there that they're either going to do uh, 25 basis points at either the next two meetings or the next three meetings. And so that's why, you know, generally speaking, there's this feeling that the range is anywhere between five and five and a quarter, but the market's clearly kind of pulling off of that. And they're saying maybe the pause comes a little bit sooner because of what we see and also the risk of that debt ceiling. And, and so this this will be something that we talk about for weeks on end now as that issue kind of builds in the pipeline. And, and we'll show you what happened in 2011 uh, with rates and sentiment and, and those types of things. But it is rather interesting. Uh, and it creates an interesting conundrum for the Fed. Do they continue to plow ahead at a time where the market's beginning to you know, have some anxiety over this deal? And, you know, again, while I don't think that there's uh, a, a serious risk of a debt default. Uh, the, the, just like 2011, uh, there was the, some anticipatory, anticipatory anxiety ahead of it. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, a view of the consensus GDP estimate for the fourth quarter. And, you know, we're going to get this number a little bit later this month, at least the first version of it. And, you know, the blue line represents the blue chip consensus, which is a, you know, it, it's a uh, it, it's a forecast of economists. Right. And so above that is the Atlanta Fed and Atlanta Fed's numbers have actually been, uh, I'll call it closer to the mark, honestly, uh, here in the last couple of quarters where they they have gauged. Uh, in, in, in fact, the third quarter number was. Uh, was uh, better, you know, I think than 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 people expected, uh, and and I have to give the Atlanta Fed credit for kind of nailing it there. But uh, you can see that they're even their forecasts are coming down. They still are a lot higher than the consensus, which is at roughly about one and a half percent for the fourth quarter. Atlanta Fed is closer to about three and three and a half. Uh, so we'll see. I bet it's uh, probably somewhere in between those. Uh, and then after that, I think that's honestly probably some of the best economic growth numbers that we're going to see for the rest of the year. Well, we'll talk about housing for a second. Some interesting data points and charts on that. Uh, you see here existing home sales uh, rolling over. You see, uh, oddly enough, you see a little bit of an uptick in uh, builder sentiment. Uh, and you know, a little bit of an uptick in overall, like say, mortgage activity off of these trough levels, but uh, clearly uh, existing home sale volume is down considerably. Uh, and then you've got the year over year over year change uh, in those bars, uh, and and then the aggregate numbers uh, in that shaded uh, kind of red uh, line there. So what we'll be continuing to talk about housing. Uh, and its various impacts. You think about second order spending, you know, at home improvement stores, repairs, uh, cleaning, uh, renovations, you know, think about all these things, uh, outfitting offices for stay, work at home and things like that, that 
housing is really important to our economy. And so when you see velocity kind of hit a tailspin like this, it, you know, it gives you pause, but it also gives you some comfort in knowing that it's going to help drive inflation lower and help slow this economy down. And we know that the Fed's taking stock of that. Now, here is that uh, home builder sentiment that I mentioned. Uh, you can see how low that number uh, went and how quickly it went throughout 2022. And, and we're kind of bouncing off of that low and you see activity as it relates to the National Association of Home Builder traffic of prospective buyers. You know, it's, it's a very similar looking chart to the home builder sentiment. Uh, and, and then uh, over on the right side is the University of Michigan survey that they do every month. And, and this one is highly sensitive to inflation. Uh, and, and we've talked about that too. But in their, their survey, uh, they ask people, where do you think home values are going to be a year from now? And uh, for the first time in years, many years, in fact, uh, outside of the pandemic, you know, now, they're now expecting uh, that uh, number to be down about 1.3%, meaning that home values on average, are going to drop about 1.3%. Now, this is, uh, I'm not going to speak necessarily to the accuracy of this type of a forecast, but, you know, at least this is what's in the minds of consumers, that they feel, okay, the real estate market's slowing down, residential real estate, and, sing and the single-family home market are all slowing down, and that we're going to have price erosion year over year. Here's a, another chart that kind of looks at that in a little bit different way. Uh, I, I like this because it, it gives you a, a plot below of the trends in the average 30-year fixed mortgage rates, uh, which we know have spiked. Uh, this number uh, I, I know is as of, uh, I believe it's as of uh, the end of the uh, year. Uh, so it's, you know, we're missing a few days in January, but, you know, you can see how that trend line was broken of increases in single family housing starts. Now, the last chart, just to be clear, was home sales, and these are housing starts. So a little bit of a different animal, but still a proxy for the health of the housing market. And then below you see the 30 year fixed mortgage rate, which uh, as you can see here has clearly been kind of in a downtrend from the global financial crisis on balance, but then picked up significantly last year. And so, you know, there, there is this correlation or inverse correlation, if you will, uh, with uh, declining rates and housing starts uh, or rates in general and housing starts. And you see how that clearly reversed uh, last year. This is uh, uh, units under construction. And uh, what's important about this is even though we talked about housing starts being down, you know, the multifamily market is really strong. I've got a summary chart that's coming up next that will kind of overlay single and multifamily. Uh, but this is something that, that is really profound. So when you think about like, you know, a real estate investment, you know, multifamily real estate investment is generally viewed as a commercial investment. So it's not viewed as residential because obviously you've got uh, business entities that, that build and own and manage these things uh, across a lot of different tenants. But, you know, multifamily construction uh, with a little bit of a pause there towards the end of last decade uh, and at the pandemic has really taken off. So this is a vehicle that's being used to help bridge the gap of that decade of underdevelopment in, in residential housing. Uh, uh, and, and you see it all across the country. Well, now we're going to overlay that multifamily. You can see that uptick from 2020. Of course, this chart perhaps is a little less dramatic, but uh, what it represents is the total number of housing starts. So including both single and multifamily. And, and uh, again, I'll kind of lump in, uh, you know, the Commerce Department defines it a little bit differently. They kind of break out the two to four units, which are like duplexes uh, versus the five or more units, which are uh, which are the, you know, the true apartment buildings. And so I just lump those two together and call them multifamily. But, you know, clearly while you've seen here in the last year, single family uh, starts moved lower that you've seen a, a, a corresponding offset here in, uh, in uh, multifamily. And uh, this is a chart that kind of looks back a little bit and kind of takes stock of 
what some of these price reductions have been. Um, I apologize, it was, it was a small chart when I pulled it out of the piece I was reading. And so blowing it up kind of blurs it just a tad here. But uh, you can see here that 34 34% uh, uh, in this survey said uh, builders were having to lower prices 6 to 10%. Uh, and, you know, 15% lowered 11 to 15%. And then you can see here, going towards the right, you know, the more significant price decreases. And uh, again, this is a national survey uh, and uh, represents 18% uh, sample size of all U.S. new home sales. Uh, so, you know, again, corroborating the thought from the Michigan consumer sentiment uh, uh, number that, uh, you know, where consumers expect prices to go down year over year, uh, this is evidence that it already happened. Uh, in a lot of markets, and and these are these are home builders, so you know just you know just understand that you know new home sales and starts are just a fraction of the uh, used market uh, or the existing home home market. Excuse me, uh, but nevertheless, it's important to know that you know we've seen a kind of a whipsaw effect in in new home prices, which you know in 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 a distant way kind of helps us understand what owner's economic rent is uh, that's embedded in the CPI. And I think when you talk about home prices, home price declines of this magnitude at the front end, uh, coupled with moderation in home prices in the existing side uh, and how that corresponds eventually into rents, I think the, these figures and why I'm showing multiple charts here, it, it, it's, it's feeding giving more feedstock to the thought that inflation is going to come down, perhaps maybe a little bit faster. And we see the rents manifest into the CPI data. That I think that's going to be profound. Well, looking at inflation in general, uh, this is a CPI figure. This is out of the Wall Street Journal. You see the actual line until we reach that dotted point and then uh, and then we see, you know, what inflation has done over the last couple of years. And, and that dotted line represents the extension of the trend line that was established in 2010 uh, through essentially that decade, 2010 to 2020. And so inflation clearly is rocketed higher. It's moderating and beginning to roll over. Uh, but, you know, this, this is for visual effect to, just to show that while things are coming down and we're, I think we're all excited about that, even the Fed's excited about that. What they're less excited about is the fact that look at how far we have to go to get back to trend. Uh, and so that that is clearly something that we're watching. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and as is the Fed in terms of kind of figuring out, you know, when to slow interest rates, when to pause, uh, how much is enough uh, and those types of things. Uh, here's a, a look at the components of prices. Uh, or different price baskets, I think, uh, would be better better put. Uh, transportation clearly has come down. New used cars prices, rental prices, uh, airfare, uh, except if you were traveling last uh, uh, last winter and, and having to book an alternative flight because your Southwest flight got canceled. Outside of that, transportation overall has come down. Uh, food and beverage still moving higher. Uh, I think we do see some moderation. In some of the components, however, you know, like eggs, as an example, uh, article this week about about eggs, and I've, I've seen eggs, <laughs> you know, like fifteen dollars a dozen or something like that. And that's just that's a, a insanely high uh, right now. So, you know, there while there are puts and takes, clearly food and beverage uh, is still in a higher inflation bucket. Uh, and but uh, if you look at shelter. Still rising, but I think as we just got through discussing, you know, that number is going to come down and we see it because it's a well understood kind of a, a leading indicator uh, where home prices are going uh, to to lead us to where, you know, rents and overall shelter, I think, are going too. And so that number is going to roll over. But outside of that overall CPI moderating, we see all the other items, uh, less food and shelter, energy and used vehicles, as it shows here in this gray line, you can see that uh, really beginning to moderate. Well, here's uh, retail sales. So uh, just to be clear, retail sales accounts for, uh, in a very rough way, maybe a half 
uh, and maybe half of, of all uh, consumption, maybe a little bit more than that. And, you know, and, and obviously the Fed is watching this. This data comes to us from the Commerce Department on a monthly basis. This is seasonally adjusted, so there's a little bit of smoothing uh, here. But, you know, this is retail food and service sales. And, uh, again, as a, an important component of uh, of consumption, uh, you know, we we certainly want to pay attention to it, and we've had a little bit of a downward revision in historical data, and the December number was down over a percent. So you see the impact of high prices, uh, and uh, perhaps the you know the pinch on homestead budgets uh, having its impact on service sales. In fact, you know, as we look back on the holiday shopping season, uh, you know, it, I think it was viewed in some respects as kind of a disappointment, uh, but. And uh, putting the positive spin on it, this is what the Fed wants to see. They want to see consumption slowing down, which in turn slows the velocity of money uh, and retail sales being an important proxy for consumption. It, it's in, in many respects good to see this number. And, you know, the interesting thing is that we're having as a result of these kind of these adverse data points, we're actually having kind of a, a rise in the amount of negative surprises uh, on economic data uh, that, uh, that we had, you know, we we're having more positive surprises in September, October, and now more negative surprises. But those negative surprises are really good because it, it helps to confirm what to the Fed, what they are trying to do. And I think it helps them hopefully get to a pause a little bit sooner rather than later. Well, here's retail sales, uh, looking at it uh, in a, uh, breaking out in two sections. There's retail sales in the control group. We know that retail sales were down. Uh, and then, then we look at retail sales on a real basis, adjusted for inflation. And you can see that number is rolling over too, uh, and has not risen by nearly as much because of the rise of inflation. Uh, again, similar trends, we see retail sales rolling over. I think, you know, the Fed wants to see this being somewhat of a continuing trend, so we'll just have to wait and see. First-time applications for unemployment benefits, I, I showed this chart last week. Uh, the trend continues. Uh, we're below the uh, pre-pandemic uh, levels, which is uh, pretty amazing. Again, you, you know, you're generally never on the edge of a recession when you see the labor market be this strong. Industrial production, uh, we looked at this last time. We know that the uh, uh, Purchasing Managers Index, the Diffusion Index, where everything below 50 uh, represents some contraction. We saw that roll over below 50 last month. We see here a clear trend in the making in terms of overall production uh, and manufacturing in particular, which is a subset of, of all uh, of, uh, uh, of entire I guess it'd be best to say the, the, the entirety of industrial production, but uh, you know you see both of those moving down in tandem. Producer prices, uh, like consumer prices, obviously important. Uh, I think this is, you know, maybe a rough, rough proxy of the potential for future inflation. Uh, oftentimes, when you get rising producer prices, the need to remain competitive. Uh, precludes a lot of producers from trying to pass those costs on to the end consumer. Uh, but, you know, and similarly, when you see producer prices going down, and they're going down rather precipitously, you can see here uh, both the all-in number as well as the uh, X food and energy, uh, in this case, trade services, you can see that both those numbers dropping meaningfully in a, in a big hurry here. Uh, you don't generally see those savings uh, being passed along to consumers uh, as much, but you do see prices coming down. So again, all of this data is good from a from a, a tracking standpoint of what we uh, uh, of what we expect the Fed to do here in the coming months. Well, let's get to the discussion of the debt ceiling uh, and the growing anxiety that's being born out of this. Uh, you know, I think this chart you know, is, is something that we're going to be talking a lot about over the, the next couple of months as the uh, Treasury deploys its um, uh, extraordinary measures to continue to fund the government uh, for a number of months while the political rhetoric uh, continues. Uh, you can see here just uh, 
you know, from a visual standpoint, the rather linear increase uh, from the beginning of the decade. So this is about a 22 year look. Uh, and then you get the global financial crisis. You see that bump up and the rate of gain uh, increases because of the crisis itself and the need to print more money to help uh, support the uh, uh, support the economy and its recovery. And so that rate of gain then itself became somewhat linear through the uh, pandemic. And you can see the massive rise uh, in the expansion of uh, government uh, in, in U.S. public debt, dollar denominated public debt as a result of stimulus payments and you know, a whole host of government spending issues. And so you, now you see this rate again, uh, you know, accelerate uh, once again, and you see that number touching that debt limit that Congress set back in the end of 2021 of 31.4 trillion. And so this chart right here is really at the root of uh, of the, the issue that these hardline Republicans, these fa this faction of hardline Republicans, again, I'm not making a political statement. I'm just acknowledging the fact that the slim majority in the House has emboldened these hardliners to take a stand against spending. And they're looking at a chart like this and saying, listen, it, had we stayed on this linear path, you know, we would not have come close to hitting this for quite some time. Uh, but the rate of spending has accelerated. They want to cut that. And so that's at the, the root of this big row that's going on right now. Uh, and, and, you know, again, something you typically see when you have limited majorities in Congress. And so, um, you know, we're going to talk about 2011 in a second. That gives us a, a good kind of um, uh, proxy to look at, even though back then, you know, the, uh, the House... Uh, had a much wider majority uh, for the GOP uh, than it does now. Uh, so th there are obviously differences, but it gives us something to, to kind of look at. But needless to say, we've hit our debt ceiling limit. Uh, Treasury is using extraordinary measures to kind of extend the funding of the government. Uh, and uh, again, we're just going to have to watch this play out a little bit. Now, I put a few slides up here for comparison and um, you know, it, you know, there's a few things to look at here. There's, you know, obviously consumer confidence and economic policy uncertainty. Um, and, and these are data series. Uh, the, the one on the top goes back to 2010. One on the bottom here, uh, economic policy uncertainty goes all the way back to 85. And you see, you know, let's just take the upper left as we go through sequentially here. Uh, consumer confidence uh, starts in 2010. 2011, you could see that, that the debt ceiling impasse there uh, kind of hurt confidence, but it recovered rather quickly. So as we think about the current environment, you know, just know that if you see a dip, you know, uh, and, and, and the expectation is that we'll have uh, at the end of the day an amicable resolution. We'll get that debt ceiling raised, probably have a continuing resolution of some sort, or if nothing else, uh, you know, we'll have uh, one of these other levers that, uh, that has been talked about recently uh, to get uh, spending pass, get debt ceiling increase. And then obviously after 2011, you can see confidence uh, continue to rise uh, consistently over time after that. Economic policy uncertainty, uh, that does gyrate a lot. You can see that that uncertainty did spike. Uh, and But just like consumer confidence, it reversed rather quickly. Uh, and there was a buildup to that, uh, though. Uh, so, uh, and then you know, overall policy uncertainty is kind of at similar levels that we were at kind of like approaching this debt ceiling impasse uh, back in 2011. Now, switching over to the right side here, we've got uh, the stock market and we've got, uh, and, and we have uh, treasuries, uh, so uh, short-term treasuries. But the S&P 500 uh, did take a dip. You can see the trends here, you know, basically, um, you know, June of that year, you know, leading up into that point. And so, you know, the market at that point was 1350, uh, dropped 200 points. Uh, so, and, you know, and then began to recover after that. And that was, you know, I think that that was a bit of a shock to the system because, you know, I really don't think we'd ever come that close to an actual uh, default situation before. And you can see, you know, the, uh, you know, looking at the flight to, uh, uh, you know, both a flight to quality, but moreover, the the risk of default on the on the one month U.S. Treasury caused that rate to spike rather dramatically 
uh, in a pretty short period of time. But once again, like essentially within the week, it was you know almost back down to where it was. So uh, you know, high amount of near term shock value that is not long term sustaining is is kind of the takeaway on this. Well, now we'll look again at the 2011 debt ceiling debate. Uh, you know, and just interject gold uh, and long term treasuries in here, and and kind of look at what happened there. And and so you know we're paying attention to this. Uh, here too. We are adding gold. Gold actually uh, weathered that little storm extremely well. Uh, so we're, you know, I think that's another reason, you know, to be glad to have some gold in the portfolio. And then also 10-year treasuries, you can see here uh, that uh, those rates moved uh, as well. And so uh, the longer term uh, income-oriented investments actually did well during that 2011 issue as well. Switching gears completely and looking at some industrial commodities, and I'm not going to spend, you know, I'm not going to go and talk about all commodities, but copper in particular is really broken out to the upside, <coughs> which is interesting. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people would attribute that to China's reopening. Uh, you know, China's a massive consumer of that, and with a reopening economy, uh, I think that's uh, speculatively driving prices higher. Uh, and then on, you know, you look at days of supply, uh, you know, you see aluminum, copper, nickel, and zinc, you know, days of supply uh, have continued to move down. So I think, you know, when you look at the industrial metal sector, you, you take stock of the China reopening, uh, we could be setting ourselves up for a, a nice little, price spike in the commodity basket. So, uh, you know, again, not talking about agricultural commodities here, but just rather industrial metals. And so you think about commodity holdings uh, that, you know, gave up a little bit at the end. Well, they gave up, they gave up some uh, at the end of the year after having really buoyed and supported the market during the turbulence on the front end, I think could be apt to receive kind of a second wind here. And looking at crude oil stocks, uh, you see stocks rising. So not much has been paid to this. Uh, you have seen increases uh, prices at the pump for uh, for gasoline, and we know distillate prices are higher. Um, but you know, again, crude oil days of supply in that blue line, which represents uh, 2022 to uh, to 23, uh, the current year number, is uh, rising above its uh, prior year level. So. Uh, you see those stocks moving higher, uh, days of oil, uh, day by, yeah, day, I'll call it days of oil uh, supply rising as well. Uh, that's uh, good news for consumers uh, and perhaps slightly less positive uh, for overall uh, oil prices. Natural gas prices, uh, and we're in the heart of the winter. And uh, what's very interesting here is these prices continue to move lower. Uh, and they're lower globally, even though natural gas is much more of a regional distribution system, although I would argue in the coming years with the Russia-Ukrainian deal in Europe, uh, that will become less so as we see more LNG uh, uh, on the market. But overall, natural gas prices going lower, uh, again, positive for consumers. That will do it for this week. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the chart pack. We'll be back uh, to you next week with uh, more of what I see in my uh, daily and weekly reading. So until then, have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you again soon.